So thank you, thank you for joining us. Thank you for everyone that has been involved in organizing this side event. Thank you for the Finland and Belgium for uh, co-sponsoring this event and, and to all of you. So we have the speakers announced, so we'll be really brief. Maria Ventura, Iga Jerzioska, Susanna Romponi, and Danilo Palotta for the MCDA. Um, I am from uh, uh, FEDA in Brussels. Um, our organizations and my organizations are all part of the Society Forum on Drugs at the uh, European level and also the Vienna NGO Committee. So for us, of course, uh, civil society is a critical partner in policy making. Decision makers must work with civil society in developing, implementing and evaluating policies. Uh, I recommend also for you to have a look at the CSFD, the Civil Society Forum on Drugs.eu website, where you will find interesting position papers and also on specific topics, but also on how to work, how to collaborate, how to implement uh, uh, works um, with civil society at the national level. Um, so the session is only 50 minutes, so uh, I won't say more about it and give the floor first to IGA as we will now have really concrete examples of how civil society can work and help governments uh, in monitoring and evaluating their policies. Yeah, thank you very much, Stefan, and thank you everyone for being here. Uh, my presentation will be um, rather general to kind of provide um, some remarks and introduction of uh, how, as Stefan said uh, already, uh, how data collection monitoring uh, can work. Uh, I will focus on our experiences as uh, Correlation European Harm Reduction Network um, that we um, gather through our annual monitoring efforts. Uh, first of all, for those of you who do not may not know uh, who we are, uh, Correlation uh, is a network established in 2000. Uh, for in Amsterdam, it's hosted by the Regenboog Group, uh, which is a low, a low threshold service provider um, in Amsterdam and Aria. And uh, we are a network of more than 360 now organizations and individuals working in harm reduction. And our monitoring started uh, in 2018. Um, with development of a framework that includes um, our network of focal points, so service provider, low threshold service providers with good connections at the national and local level and uh, good knowledge uh, about the situation in their cities. We collect data at the city level uh, and the main three, three main uh, or kind of core topics that we cover uh, essential harm reduction services, uh, HIV responses uh, among people who use drugs, and uh, new drug trends. We at the moment have uh, 42 uh, focal points and on average uh, 35 participate <coughs> every year uh, in the monitoring that consists of survey, focus groups, interviews, and so on. So I would just uh, like to address um, basically the aspects in how uh, data collected by civil society uh, is different uh, than those uh, collected by the national agencies um, or international organizations. So, uh, first of all, civil society organizations are independent from, uh, from the governments, from business and so on. Uh, the relevance of it is that uh, with this monitoring efforts that we as Correlation, for example, uh, do um, we try to keep governments accountable, keep donors accountable for implementing policies that they declare to implement? The second uh, main aspect is the is the partnership. So uh, of course there is this independence, but we still work uh, in close cooperation uh, with policymakers, contributing with our information to uh, the policy making processes, policy implementation processes, policy evaluation processes. And third of all, uh, we connect. So there is a connection that we establish between service providers and decision makers, but also, most importantly, I would say, uh, between the communities of people uh, who use drugs and policy makers, because this is one of our core um, activities and, and goals to provide this connection between 
communities and um, policy making. So the data uh, collected by uh, correlation, as I said already, it, it is collected at city level, uh, contrary to uh, many a lot of data um, that is collected by the governments, that is the national level normally, and it reflects service providers' experiences. Okay, so uh, it doesn't. It is. Uh, it is uh, direct data provision. It doesn't go through. I don't know several levels of intermediaries, aggregation, and so on. And what it means finally. So we have service providers with hands-on experience. We have service providers who are characterized by uh, deep compassion towards the communities that they serve, and we have service providers who are knowledgeable. Uh, about the needs of uh, the communities that they serve. And these three key aspects contribute to this uniqueness of the data that uh, we collect. And this uniqueness is um, manifested in uh, the more qualitative and index character of the data uh, that we have. Uh, so it's not numerical, it's, uh, it's more qualitative. Uh, it is contextualized, and I think this is extremely important because, um, because we ask our focal points, our service providers, for example, to what extent uh, services in your city are able to deliver particular services to the communities. So it's not we have three services. We have the extent which provides this context to regarding the needs uh, of people uh, who use drugs. This data is reliable because there is a, a high level of trust established between uh, us and our focal points, but also between the communities and the service providers in low threshold harm reduction services. This data is a real-time data because we can uh, we see it uh, from uh, service providers at all times, basically. It's not a, a data that is collected at one point in time, for example, uh, two years ago, but it's a real-time data and it's also timely. So we report within half a year up until one year uh, on a certain situation. So there is less delay than uh, in more bureaucratic contexts. And this all makes our information, I think, complementary to what is collected. So it's not, uh, we don't see it as uh, competing with the, uh, the data collected by, for example, EMCDDA or, or the governments, we see it as complementary. Um, yes, and I think that that would be it for me regarding this general context. Thank you very much. Uh, regarding one more thing, sorry, uh, regarding we have uh, leaflets with our newest publications. I think, yes, they were distributed. So you can see uh, the publications that we released from December up until today all on this leaflet via the QR codes. Thank you. We'll take the questions afterwards, so we'll directly give the floor to Mireya. Yes. In a second. Oh, no. No, this is mine. Yes. <laughs> this is yours. Here we go. Great. So thank you for the invitation, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my goal today is trying to explain why drug checking services, which is a tool that we were using with harm reduction for a lot of years, is now a, a very useful monitoring tool. <coughs> because uh, these drug checking services are directly tailored to people who are using drugs and adapted to their needs. But also since 2011, thanks to a, a big European project that we made with Stefan, uh, we have a big network with all the drug checking services that are collecting data in Europe, and at this moment we have 25 uh, members, and we are using different techniques and different approaches, but finally the goal is exactly the same. And one of the differences that we have from other ways of monitoring is that we have the trust of people. The data that they are sending to us, the, the samples, uh, are based on trust, the relationship that we have with them, because they totally trust with the type of intervention that we are giving in, in these, in these uh, interventions, but also at the same time, they want to, to feel which is, uh, how is the market and, and which is the composition of their drugs. They are very concerned about this. They are totally aware that this is an illegal wall. And then we can have this type of information. For example, uh, this is one of the reports that we 
we made recently in, in the information that we gave with the help of correlation. And in these reports, we can show, the, for example, the situation of the MDMA in terms of all the adulteration. No? For example, in this graph, we can see perfectly that uh, if we compare the samples that are arriving with the content, we can see that most of samples, the, the vast majority, is MDMA without adulteration, that this is this uh, light color. And if we compare with cocaine, we can see that it's just the opposite, that the, the substances are mainly adulterated and mainly what we can see is that the cocaine have several adulterants. So this is thanks also to this expectation that we have from users and that they explain that this sample is cocaine and that they want to know exactly the content. So we are not only detecting substances, we can also figure out how the market is, com is, is composed. And this is thanks to this connection that we have with people, this efforts that we have with them, trying to adapt as much as we can the drug checking services to their needs and to the market. And this is why also we trust that the results that we are giving are relevant for them and are useful for them. This is one of the examples of the, one of the articles that we made uh, with the Teddy Network about the behavior and the, and, the, and the actions that they take after our drug checking services. This is one of the examples of a big queue for a drug checking service in one festival in Portugal. This queue was in between two or three hours, uh, just at 40 degrees, so they are really willing to test with us. And the most important thing is that when they have a substance that is not the expected substance, the vast majority, so the intention is 93%, but also when we are asking for the behavior, we can see perfectly that they are not only saying that they are not going to use this substance, that also they are doing this. So the type of information that we are sending and that we are giving to them, make them and help them to take some decisions. This is another example of a big festival where we were detecting big uh, high dosage pills. And for example, the organizer, what he was telling, this was the first time that they had drug checking services at their festival, is that only to know the drugs that are circulating there, it gives this reserved feeling, but also the, the person who was in charge of the emergency department, what was uh, telling is once these warnings were launched, the emergency departments were empty. Because when you are mm, giving this type of information, people are, are adapted to this information and then uh, we detect several pills that were high dose, but uh, finally the emergencies were not done. And then uh, this is also a process that we have very well worked, the warning system. So every warning that we are preparing, we are always uh, thinking and evaluating the risk of the substance. So we have different levels with the warnings. And when we have the red alerts, uh, that means that this is the most uh, dangerous uh, possibility that we can have. And we also select where and who will receive this information. So if the warning is not very dangerous, we are only giving to the person and trying that uh, this information circulates between the friends. But when we are detecting but possible no high potent substances, such as this example, then these are war, uh, red warnings. And these warnings are going directly, massively, to uh, reach people this. We have several examples that when we reach uh, this high population, the death uh, stopped. This, uh, this, for example, is another example of a recent detection of nitazines in Ireland. The warnings were launched, but until when they contact, the government contact with the people who are providing information to uh, you know, the harm reduction services, were able to transmit and to adapt this warning, as we can see here with this type of, of design. And only when this type of alert uh, was launched, uh, the death stopped. So finally, it's very important how you are uh, giving this information and how you are re reaching your target group. And also we need to go further because we are now facing a very difficult situation in terms of these new synthetic drugs and a lot of different things that we are detecting from the field that will help us to understand how drug use will be in the next years. But uh, also we are evaluating all the warnings that we are launching and we are evaluating the message that we are giving and the type of, of results and the type of answers because we don't only want to work at the short term, we also want to work at mid and long term. 
and that means that we need to understand also which type of message are good for our target group. This sense, I would recommend the publication that we made recently with the MCDA that was last October, and that we are talking about these health risk communication strategies that we are using at track checking services based on the experience and on, on all the communication and connection that we have with our DARSI group. So, as a conclusion, conclusions, I would like to highlight that these drug checking services are very good tools for monitoring drug markets, mainly because we have this expectation from the people who are delivering the samples. Also, that they are very valuable tools for public health because uh, we can reach these hard to reach communities. It's very difficult sometimes to contact with people who are using drugs if you are not giving them uh, to them something that is interesting. We need to think that for these people is not working, the general prevention, because they are using drugs, so we need to go for more specific information. And then um, also these uh, drug checking services are very respect by our target group, so this is also very important because we have big impact on these communities. And one of the biggest examples are warnings, because are extremely useful to remove these toxic products, because once <coughs> we launch these warnings, the intoxications or even the death is stopped. <coughs> And then it's very important to understand the current situation that we are facing. We are in a very critical moment, and we need to effectively prevent the future and all the issues that can uh, come from these uh, new synthetic uh, drugs. And then drug checking services also, we need to adapt to all the reality, and we need to know exactly which is the situation to help to develop the message and to work for the next prevention. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, I want to share with you uh, our 15 years experience with the Libro Bianco in Italian and the white paper, or if you want a shadow report, that uh, we um, present every year on the 26th of June in the press room of our parliament uh, as a, a counter voice. Uh, um, of the governmental uh, report, yearly report uh, on, uh, on drugs. Uh, we uh, started with uh, this uh, initiative, and um, I want to say also that uh, the White Book is uh, also in the framework of the Support Don't Punish campaign uh, this is, that support us in the publication of, uh, of the White Book. We started with this uh, experience uh, in uh, 2009, um, st uh, just uh, uh, looking at the data that the government produced every year about the new law approved in 2006, uh, which was a, which uh, um, was a, a really uh, counter reform, a very punitive and repressive uh, drug law, and of course every year the government uh, publishes their data on the implementation of the, this law, and the, at the time of the third report, we realized that the data that the government uh, published. Uh, saying that this law did work, was a, a success. From our perspective, this data showed the uh, disastrous in impact of the new law on people uh, who use drug and home community. So we realized that we have the, the possibility and also the necessity to reinterpret this data so the characteristic of this report is not to find or invent a new source, but to make a, a different analysis and to go inside and behind, behind the numbers that the government uh, produce. Uh, so we work for five uh, years, every year, monitoring and reinterpreting this, uh, this uh, data. And um, in uh, 2014, we, we, we were successful because this law was abrogated by the High Court, not only thanks to us, but also thanks to us. And then we realized that this kind 
of monitoring um, can be could be uh, useful and so we decided to go on because after the abrogation of this law we came back to the previous law that is anyway a, a repressive law so now we are always uh, uh, on uh, trying to, to, to promote a reform of this uh, previous law too. Um, but this experience with the High Court uh, told uh, us something. First of all, that showing uh, evidence of the impact of unexpected uh, or unintentional outcomes of the law is useful in uh, promoting, uh, promoting advocacy action. So showing evidence is useful. Uh, we learn also that the process data are not enough when presented in a mm, bureaucratic way. So numbers uh, are not neutral. Numbers need to be uh, interpreted from different perspectives. Uh, we, we realize that the plurality of, uh, of uh, analysis approaches are uh, important. Uh, we um, made a um, uh, collaboration and partnership with different uh, civil society organizations. First of all, with uh, the organization working in prison, uh, in prison uh, sector. And uh, we create, uh, we started only with two partners, so my organization, Forum Droghe, and Antigone, which is the most important Italian NGO working on prison. And nowadays we are uh, nine civil society organizations because we wanted to involve, you know, many, many other um, perspective and, uh, and culture on, uh, on drugs. And uh, then we realized that uh, an active protagonism of all the actors involved is uh, uh, absolutely important to, to produce uh, the, the assessment of uh, uh, the drug law. Uh, so I go quickly uh, there because uh, so we all, all of us know that the numbers are not ne neutral, are not objective. Uh, numbers uh, need to be seen in their context uh, to have a meaning. And uh, numbers mu must be queried, compared and integrated. And that is what, what we uh, do with this our work. Only a few examples of what um, uh, we uh, stress uh, and um, evidence with our work. That is what uh, the government reports forget uh, uh, to say about uh, uh, their own data. For instance, uh, we um, stress that uh, uh, comparing data on criminalization and repression and the trend on uh, the use of drug and on the development of the illegal market, uh, no decrease uh, happened in the use and in the market, notwithstanding a very repressive law. Uh, we stress, for instance, that uh, our prisons are overcrowded of people, but are overcrowded of small fishes. So this law affects not great, great traffickers that are only the 3% of all the mm, mm, prison population, but the, the, the small fish, the small dealer that uh, um, often are users themselves, and in Italy, they are one third of the uh, total prison population. Um, then, for instance, um, uh, if uh, um, the minor dealer are the most affected from a penal sanction, it means that many people who use drug are inside prison because many more small dealers are users themselves. Or, for instance, another interesting uh, numbers uh, deals with the trials and with the attitude of a judge uh, towards uh, the people who uh, make uh, drug crimes. Uh, we uh, discovered that uh, seven out of uh, ten drug trials end with the sentences, while only one out and with the sentence for all other crimes. This, this, this is the evidence of a very repressive attitude of uh, the, the judge, for instance. And uh, another thing important deals with administrative sanction. 
that uh, um, uh, affect uh, people who use drugs in a very hard way and uh, influ have a great uh, and negative influence on their lives. And the most important, uh, that administrative sanction deals with the young people. The young adults are more than one third of uh, people who receive an administrative sanction. And the great part, of the 75%, are cannabis user. So this is only a few examples, but uh, every year the, the, the White Book uh, uh, presents a lot of uh, consideration like that. And so our question is, can we draw some evident conclusion about current drug policies starting from this picture? And our answer is yes, we, we, we can draw some conclusion in a re reform uh, perspective. Uh, this is only to, to remind that uh, in the second part of uh, the White Book, every year we focus on some specific topics that is, is, that is on the agenda of the, the debate, uh, national debate on drugs. And we uh, give also voice to uh, local, for instance, local research a local uh, report so that to wider the, the, the source uh, of knowledge. Uh, so uh, to conclude, we think that uh, it, it is um, important to go on because uh, um, around the uh, publication of this uh, shadow report, uh, there is now a very strong network uh, of uh, uh, organization and uh, uh, it is a useful tool for uh, advocacy action for many, for many move, movements. Of course, there are some challenges. Uh, the most important challenge deals with a problem that uh, all of us know very well, and that is, that is the dialogue between policy makers and evidence. Uh, so we uh, know that we... Um, uh, adopt uh, a very rational, a reasonable language, but it's not always clear if this language is uh, uh, understandable for, by the policymaker, but we think that we have to continue and to uh, insist uh, because uh, uh, evidence and counter evidence is an important tool we, we have and we must use it in the best way. Thank you. Thank you very much for these three examples of what civil society can do and also in terms of monitoring and then also how these results can be used in different ways. There are also, of course, many other examples. These were the three ones for today. And, and now I will give the floor to Danilo from the MCDDA, as it is also, of course, really interesting for us to know from a European agency what can be the, the perspective uh, in relation with collaborating with, with civil society and also <coughs> what it has been maybe so far and what it could be in the future uh, in the next years. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, this invitation, Iga, and you. And uh, It is a pleasure to talk about data collection and monitoring from, an, from a civil society perspective at this moment, at this CND, because the wise EU legislator and some of the policy makers are here in this room decided to change the mandate of the agency. On the 2nd of July, we will be moving from a monitoring center, from an observatory, to a fully fledged drug agency. We will be called the UDA or UDA, European Union Drugs Agency. And uh, to show you the difference between before and after, before the, all, the current regulation mentioned only one civil society, only once, and says NGOs, collaborate with, civil, with NGOs and the others. The new one mentioned civil society 20 times. And there is even an article about it. Uh, so the legislator wants us to maintain, I say maintain cooperation with relevant civil society organization active in the field covered by the regulation. However, if you read the document, this maintain is not such a maintain. If you read all the article, is to establish um, a steady, systematic collaboration to consult, exchange information, and pull knowledge 
from uh, civil society. So this is not maintained, this is much more. Also because it requires the, the, the UDA to have a single contact point under the directorate, under the authority of the director, for a sort of lia civil society liaison officer in the, in the agency, and also to have a platform where to exchange information. There is a very important condition, for us it's absolutely key, and is in the recital seven, and says that any, so this, this collaboration should be understood to maximize efficiency in monitoring, assessing, and responding to drug phenomenon. I think this is a, a key element which will filter also the kind of collaboration that we will have, also the kind of uh, civil society agencies we will be in dialogue to, because everything must respond to this part. We need to maximize what we do. As in, a, in any relationship, we, if we are together, we should be better than uh, when we were separated. So the, the, this, this marriage means that we, the, the agency needs to be more performant and needs to be better equip, equipped to monitor, respond and evaluate the phenomenon. It's not that until now we haven't done it. As you can see, we are working with the TEDDY project, absolutely key, timely information, which um, is, is uh, um, integrating the more solid, robust, but sometimes low information. Together, they can really give the, and it's not only this, we have the escape project, which is about um, analyzing the syringe residues, so we understand which kind of drugs are mixed together in the syringes, and this comes from NGOs in the floor, in, in, the, in the ground. So this is absolutely relevant for, for us. We, um, we have to integrate this in the new system, so we will start working on that from July, so it's possible that by the end of the year, next year, we will have some, we need to have uh, structures in order to understand how we want to collaborate. At the moment, there are many questions they are working with. Who is civil society? Because the, the commission has solved this question, but for their own purposes. The commission as the Civil Society Forum on Drugs, commission is a policy body. We are a technical agency. Therefore, we have to understand what is civil society for us. The regulator, the legislator here came in to help a little. He said civil society organization working in the, uh, in the field covered by regulation, because that's a lot. But then he said affected community by drugs and crime and, and, and the drug issue. And then people use drugs. And this is a, a really a revolution, because as you know, this has not been really much done until, the past, until, until now. We have to find systematic ways to also integrate this population in, our, in maximizing what we do. So as you can imagine, it's not very easy. Uh, we need to solve questions like how we do that. Uh, civil society could be huge. Uh, <coughs> the, regulate, the legislator does not stop at the EU because he said national, regional, and international. And therefore, we need to understand what's the threshold. Is the African uh, civil society on drugs relevant for us? Is the Canadian civil society for, relevant for us? There are all questions that, of course, impact also in the efforts we have to play, in the resources we have to, to deploy. Um, so it's very exciting, very difficult. What we know very well, we, we are not a, a political agent. We will never be a political agent until a regulation change again. And we, uh, and therefore, all sorts of uh, agency and um, civil society working in the political area, maybe they find they will find less attractive to work with us. And um, also because we in the civil society, we need to, and we are very clear, we have to understand that we are moving in a field that does not really belong institutionally to us. Civil society might have another another view, but it belongs to member states as as policy initiatives. So we are there to help, to support, to promote, to improve, uh, but not to make or to do in, in, in on their behalf. And this, this is very, very clear. And probably the success of the MCDA in the last 25 years is because we had this very clear from the beginning and we never stepped out of our role. Um, therefore, it's very exciting. At the moment, I am in charge of transmitting this until my director will finally give this task to someone, to a, to a lucky one, or a lucky lady or man. And, um, and this probably will be communicated uh, 
be our website, but certainly <coughs> people working in civil society organization in the field of drugs in Europe and around will uh, will be will be contacted by us. We are uh, we want to have um, a, a transparent and clear and open conversation and dialogue. There are no at the moment there are no preclusion. There are no walls. We can listen to anything. We can accept all sorts of uh, proposals, then we will be asked to decide and we will present this to our management board according to what the regulation have said. But this, uh, in, in our little words, is a revolution and we think it is a needed one because it's where, you know, cer a certain part of the world is going and the EU drug agency could not be left out. So very happy about that, but uh, thrilled but also a bit concerned about the work that we, if we will be up to the, to the expectations. Thank you for your, for the, for your listening. Thank you very much for this very clear explanation. Everybody understood this special moment that is happening in the next month for us in Europe and in defining with you and finding the way that this will happen in, in the future. Uh, now the floor is, is you, for you. I don't know if you want to ask some questions to one of the speakers on specific uh, details of a project or more largely on collaborating with CSF. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, my name is Marcia and I'm from Sweden. I'm from Persian uh, Control, but also from Ukraine, just part of the the coalition of international youth farm reduction and drug policy reform organizations. And my question is, how can we use these resources um, to empower youth-led initiatives for this research, monitoring, and evaluation of drug policies for and by young people who use drugs in a way that's sustainable and collaborative and that really takes full advantage of our unique um, position to reach uh, the people who use drugs are affected by drug policies. And um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> this one of you want to respond to this? Yeah, so I think that um, there are collaborations in place between organizations like Youthrise, for example, and, uh, and organizations that are uh, not in exclusively uh, focused on youth. I think that's one of the ways of um, finding these connections and um, kind of enhancing empowerment would lie in uh, collaborations, perhaps in different uh, kind of long -term, longer term projects um, where young people could on one hand get some funding for their activities. Uh, on the other hand, they could also uh, exchange the knowledge, experience, and skills with other people who are in the field for a little bit longer, maybe. Uh, as correlation specifically, we uh, really pay attention to have at least one. We have, uh, we have an advisory committee um, to our network, and um, I believe the Eight, eight people, eight individuals in the advisory committee, and we, we really uh, strive to have at least one young person representative of, of youth in our advisory committee. Now, uh, with upcoming elections uh, in the coming weeks, hopefully more. Uh, so, yeah, I would say that from the top of my head, this could be the venues to, to address. To, uh, to achieve what you are, what you are uh, hoping for, or aiming for. Yeah. We have a small um, youth-led event on the drug use um, and opioid use by and for young people who use drugs. We want to escalate it as much as we can. Yeah, don't hesitate to engage and, and join some of these international networks or even apply to, if it's European, to be a member of the civil society from on drugs at the European level, uh, and I, I guess in a few months there will be the new uh, cycle, and, and I think it's more or less 45 um, representat organization representative civil society around Europe that are then uh, selected to to be in this civil society forum. 
for the next cycle. Uh, hi everyone, Miri Yuji from IDPC, and that's a question from Leia. Uh, so you showed the amazing network that you have on drug checking services in Europe, and I was wondering if this has or has the potential of being expanded globally, uh, especially for example in North America and Latin America, where is an expansion also of these services and the synthetic drugs market is also quite prominent. So I was kind of wondering if you've already started developing that or if there's plans to do that. Yes, uh, thanks Marie for the question. As far as I know, they are trying to. Um, it's mainly a network from you know, South America also and Central America, but also network more from the part of the North. But, but yeah, finally, what we were bringing in the beginning is also structures thanks to a project. So what it makes a difference, <coughs> Uh, for TED is that we have a common da database, that this database is, is being fed by all the data of the members, and we have a data manager who is a person who is harmonizing this database in the sense that for the partners, for the members of TED, is not a lot of work also, it's not work for them, it's only to send their own database and, and we are harmonizing it to the, to the TED template. So this is also sometimes difficult to manage because no, every country has their own language and their own way of, of functioning, their own uh, indicators or their own way of monitoring. So to try to share the same way of monitoring is, is one first step, that this is thing that we, what they are trying to do. But then to read these harmonized databases, uh, this is not easy. So at least we will need some budget from the beginning or so of course we can share because you can do it with not a lot of money but uh, you need a person who is harmonizing because if not you cannot ask partners regularly because this is also one of the most important things to be on time with data so it makes sense when you have the data from the previous six months or but not from the previous two years because you don't have time to update it all the time Benjamin and Catherine. Um, thank you for the visit. I'm Benjamin Tsvenare from the Federation Edition, which is a network of addiction professionals in France. And I have a question more for um, Ilya and Susanna. Once you've published a report, uh, how do you, what do you do in terms of dissemination and communication so it has a, a, an impact on public policy? Do you have methods? How do you do? And um, for the correlation report, I ask also for myself, like, we are the focal point for France, maybe we don't do enough to disseminate what's in it. So. Yes, so um, we do have executive summaries in several languages, first of all. Uh, I think it's eight or ten languages, ten languages this year. I'm not sure if all of them are, all of them are ready uh, already, I think. So this is one of the, uh, of the channels of dissemination just to, to aid, I think French is also included. Um, then we organize webinars in the beginning of the year to discuss these results and their uh, uh, consequences for advocacy, for policy making. Uh, we do attend conferences um, with these results. And well, this question that you're asking has been actually a question that um, our members of Focal Points have been asking also in the recent years. So in this year's work plan, in every, if everything goes according to the plan, we will also have um, are part of a project that is dedicated to providing advocacy, um, support, guidance, uh, and training to selected organizations to equip them in skills uh, that would allow them to use these uh, publications more at the local or national level in uh, policy making. It is, it is definitely a challenge to connect the data that we collected, the report that we publish, to very tangible actions on the ground. Uh, we are getting there, but I, uh, it's just the beginning of the way. Uh, with regard with um, our uh, report, uh, first of all, we uh, mm, try to make a good use of our network, you know. So we have uh, um, collaboration in, at the different levels, for instance, for trade unions, of so people working in the public sector, or lawyer, or uh, judge association, and uh, uh, every kind of network at the social, uh, civil society level. So we uh, spread uh, our publication, but also organize many events 
different events in different contexts, and this is very effective. And it is effective also, what I said before, to present our, um, ourselves as the counter voice of the, of the government, starting from the same data. This is very strong, I think, and, uh, and, and effective. And then we, um, of, on the other side, send a copy uh, every year of the book to each parliament members because of course this is a, a, a target very important for us because the final uh, goal for us is to, to promote uh, a drug law reform, a drug policy reform. And then of course all the web and uh, social media channels. But it's a very uh, important to, the, to go uh, on, all over the country in presence and to meet you know, different groups and different uh, contexts in, in, in presence. So I, I think it's effective. Hi, my name is Catherine Schiffer, Correlation European Homepage Network. I just wanted to follow up on what you were saying. Uh, I think the follow up of preparing all these kinds of reports is extremely important. And also, probably for civil society, the most difficult one. Because you can collect all kinds of data and you can create uh, potential evidence for, uh, for development. But if you do not reach policymakers or politicians, will always stop. So I think this new advocacy mentorship program, what we want to develop, should be really focusing also on a very specific situation in the country or at the city level and to see what kind of things we can push for. I mean, we can prepare policy papers at local level, but this alone will not help. So probably it is needed, you know, to reach out and we can look into ways how to do this. But we also need to realize that most of our focal points and members are organizations, service providers, who do not have advocacy in their main uh, pocket of activity. So this is also the kind of limitation we are seeing. And capacity. Yeah, and the capacity, yes. yeah. yeah. This is one of the biggest problems. Yes. But one more thing in response to what you said. Uh, I think something like the monitoring, there are many good practices, or there, there's a lot of experience now, I think we have developed it after working for it for a long time, and I think this kind of um, the balance between create, doing research with people who are not necessarily researchers can be a really good thing, and uh, I think we should make use of the networks, also from daily network and the other networks, on how to do it. We do have a group of people who are instrumental that researchers who would love to. So maybe one last quick question. The lights were flickering before, so <laughs> I think it's time to wrap up. Thank you very much for your I, attention. I would just and say one word. We are having, we are organizing this correlation in December in Warsaw. European Harm Reduction Conference this uh, this year, and Manu, then uh, you are uh, more than welcome to apply with abstracts. We also we also have a thematic issue. I already talked to Rebecca about it uh, of Harm Reduction Journal, and we are focusing on community <coughs> submissions. Uh, I will, we absolutely will try to provide mentorship if necessary and support um, on the way uh, if uh, if it is required. Uh, so submission on the on the youth um, harm reduction, uh, youth related issues are also very very welcome. <coughs> we can we can discuss it uh, at some point if you are interested. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Thank